somewhat forgotten where we were last time. But uh, let me just quickly review. The idea of complexity is, if you like, a measure of how hard it is to go from here to there, where here is someplace special, which you think of as simple, and there is someplace general, which may or may not be complex. The complexity, of course, is the measure of how many steps, how many elementary steps it takes to get where you're going, or how long it takes, if you count the time in units of uh, small steps. This is what? Well, all right, all right, let's just uh, write it down. There's two kinds of complexity that we'll deal with. One of them is called state complexity, and the other is called uh, complexity of unitary operators. They're closely connected, but let me just write it down in particular. Um, the complexity of unitary operators, when I speak about complexity, I'm always imagining a system of qubits, a system of n qubits. But the complexity of a unitary operator is, I'll give you a unitary operator, and I ask you to build it out of a product of gates. Let's just, for simplicity, let's just say two qubit gates, two and one qubit gates. We want to build it out of a product of gates. I won't label them as the first gate. The first gate is over here. The second, which one's the first one? The first one is over here. Then the next one, then the next one, the next one. This is the last one. Uh, the gates are in general different from each other. The minimum number of gates that it takes to build that unitary is a uh, sort of classic and standard definition of gate complexity. It has a maximum value. It cannot be bigger than a certain thing. If you have n qubits, the size of the Hilbert space is uh, bounded. The volume of the Hilbert space, the volume of the space of um, uh, the volume of the group, the unitary group, is bounded. And there does exist a maximal complexity. I'm being a little bit deliberately um, negligent about keeping track of epsilons. In general, with a definition of complexity, you usually mean to get within some epsilon, to get within some accuracy, and don't demand perfection. I've left out issues of epsilons here, which will come back. They'll come back and haunt us. Uh, but in any case, the maximum complexity, basically for, for given epsilon, for given precision, the maximum complexity is always of order 4 to the n. Prefactors can occur in front of this, and the prefactors might depend on epsilon and details of, uh, of what kind of gates you're allowed and so forth. But the maximum complexity of any unitary operator is of order 4 to the n. Uh, is epsilon in general power law in end or exponential? It's usually, you don't know, what do you mean it's epsilon? Well, epsilon is a small number. Yeah, but is it like 1 over n small? Or like no, it's just epsilon. fixed and small. Fixed and small. Okay. Fixed and small. And things generally depend on logarithmically. So uh, it's not usually a um, uh, serious uh, factor, but it's, it is interesting to, to worry about. Okay. Now, we can, uh, this is the definition of the complexity of the unitary operator. There's also a notion of relative complexity of states. The relative complexity of states, let's say the relative complexity of uh, two states, A and B. I won't bother writing ket symbols around A and B. A and B are now two states. The uh, relative complexity of C C of A and B is just you look at all possible unitary operators which can take you from A to B. That's supposed to be an equal sign in there. You look at all possible unitary operators and you ask what's the least complex unitary operator that can get you from A to B. 
that equivalently the minimum number of gates that it takes from A to B. That's the relative complexity of uh, two states. And you can try to define an absolute complexity of, uh, of a state by picking A once and for all and saying A is something very simple to make. A simple thing to make would be, for example, the qubit state O, 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 dot, dot, dot. We assume we can create qubits in the computational basis like this. Computational basis just means the sigma z basis. We assume that that's not too hard to build. And then the, um, the what's called the absolute complexity of B, absolute, would just be the relative complexity, would just be the relative complexity, I don't know, just be the relative complexity of a simple state and B. Okay. Minimum number of gates that it goes to go, go from a, a simple state to, uh, to B. Okay, now. Next, we're interested in the evolution of systems, evolution of quantum systems, in which case you could be, this is, this is definition of complexity over here. This has got nothing to do now with the dynamics that may generate you. This is a definition of complexity. The dynamics that might generate you might be that you might be the time evolution operator for some quantum system. In other words, it may be e to the minus i h t, with h being some specific Hamiltonian. Uh, the specific Hamiltonian that will assume is what's called k-local, that never involves more, it never involves in any given term more gates than, let's say, two. Some simple Hamil some Hamiltonian built up out of simple pieces. We run the Hamiltonian for some time. At t equals 0, u is just the identity operator. The complexity is by definition 0 of u. We evolve it for some time. We get some unitary operator. And then we go back and we ask, what is the minimum number of gates that could have constructed that, uh, uh, that operator? Okay. That's, uh, that's the definition, then, of the evolution of complexity for a quantum system, in this case defined by, um, by a Hamiltonian H. We could even consider, there's no reason why we have to have H be a time-independent Hamiltonian, but let's say it's specified. Whatever the Hamiltonian is, even if it's a function of time, it's been specified. Uh, if it was a function of time, then we would want to write a more complicated thing here. We would want to write the path-ordered uh, evolution or time-ordered uh, uh, evolution. But whatever it is, it has a complexity, and the complexity will be a function of time. Okay. It'll be 0 at t equals 0, and it will grow, because it can't do anything else other than grow. Okay. okay. So the first statement, I think we I introduced this last time, is that, and again, how much of this is a theorem and how much of it is just general expectations, I don't really know. Um, but let's just say it is widely accepted that for some period of time, the complexity increases linearly. Uh, it increases as if the evolution here was evolution by a product of gates and the minimum, prob uh, the minimum product of gates would just be the actual product of gates that, uh, that generate the circuit, that generate the, uh, the unitary. And then it grows. How far it grows linearly like that, nobody can prove. Uh, but let's make a conjecture. The conjecture is that complexity grows as fast as it can. We can discuss this conjecture. We can discuss the evidence for it. But right now, let's just make it. So it will grow linearly. It can't grow faster than linear. If, for example, we imagine that U was actually made out of a product of gates, maybe a repeated short circuit, a repeated low-depth circuit, 
just keep iterating it over and over, uh, that is one way of making you. And uh, is it obvious that it cannot grow faster than linear? I think it's obvious. Okay. Can it grow slower than, you, uh, than linear? Yes, and in fact, it must stop growing linearly when it reaches the maximum. So it turns over, it may fluctuate, I don't know. There are a lot of states. It's not just that this is the maximum complexity. Almost all states, the vast, overwhelming majority of states or of unitary operators have this very, very large complexity. And so you're likely as not that once you get up there to hover around there for a very long time because it's very hard to get out of the, uh, the um, sub-manifold of very high complexity states. There's just so many of them. Almost any direction you move in, you will still be in a high complexity. And incidentally, all the same things I'm saying are also true of entropy of a system. Uh, that you reach equilibrium and then you hover around in equilibrium, maximal, maximal entropy for a long time. But on some time scale, there are recurrences. It's possible to prove, given a Hamiltonian, that on a time scale, no longer, or well, first of all, what is this time scale? This time scale will be of order t of order e to the number of qubits. And let's also write that as e to the entropy of the system, uh, since typically a typical state of n qubits will have entropy of order the number of qubits. So the time that it takes to get to here will be of order the maximal complexity itself if it's linear. So after an exponential amount of time, you'll reach some sort of equilibrium. You can't avoid it. Yeah. Is this a graph of state complexity or the complexity? It could be either. It could, could be either. either. It could be either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the difference would be state complexity is bounded by two to the n. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, so how exactly do we handle like continuous time? Like I get if you like double the time, then you just apply the unitary twice. But if I took yeah. like like one point one times the time, like. How do I even know that my set of states can no. generate that? We need a definition of complexity which is not hinged or linked to this very discrete picture of gates, and we'll come to it. Okay. We, need, we need a generalization of these ideas that is not really restricted to a product of gates. It's too discrete for our purposes, but it, uh, it gives us some intuition to what to look for. And there are definitions of complexity that are not linked to, uh, to the uh, to the discrete. The, the reason that all of the thinking has been so tied to gates is because almost all of that thinking is due to computer scientists. That's it. Very few physicists or mathematicians have uh, thought about how to think about the complexity of a uh, of an evolving continuous system. Let me say one more thing about complexity. In a sense, it's how hard it is to get from something simple to something compl complex. I sometimes like to think of it in the other way. I like to ask the question, what if I have a state? How hard is it to bring it back to something simple? Having a simple state, for a computer, for example, you like to start your computer in the simplest possible state, all spins up or something like that. If it starts out too complicated, you uh, you have a it, it makes it hard to do computation, it makes it hard to, uh, to to get started. It's good to start with a simple state, for many reasons. In black hole physics, if Alice and Barb want to jump into a wormhole and get together, it turns out that it's best to do it from the simplest possible state. So, in a sense, simplicity is a kind of resource. It's good to have simplicity. Uh, bad to have complexity in some sense. And if you are interested in your, your, your quantum computer is now in some state, and you want to know how to reversibly bring it back to, uh, to a simple state, what is the cheapest way in terms of gates to bring it back to a simple state? The answer is the same answer, the complexity. Okay, so 
um, sometimes I think it's interesting to think not how, how, how hard it is to get to someplace complex, but how hard is it to get back from some, someplace complex. Yeah, okay. Uh, what is, I'm confused about why it's better to start with something com uh, simple relative instead of complex. Can I just well, okay. redefine complexity to be complexity relative to the state I'm in and then I'm always in a simple state? That won't help you at all if you were trying to do computations with the, uh, your computer. Um, keep in mind that the simple things that you can do with the computer, the gates that you can uh, do and so forth, are in some particular basis. Uh, the whole ideas of complexity and gates and all those things are not unitarily um, symmetric. They are very, very definitely dependent on a choice of basis. The choice of basis, when you say, or when I say, that the things you can do involve small number of degrees of freedom at a time, small number of degrees of freedom in one basis. Uh, so there's some element of locality, notion of locality, that, uh, but it, you know, it's a good question. It's a fair question, but um, I'm not going to answer it. Okay. So if, you're, if you have a quantum computer and you want to do something with it, you sure don't want to start in one of these very complex states up here. There's no place to go afterwards except to rattle around among the very complex states. So it's very hard to imagine doing a computation if you start out in a state of maximal complexity here. What you want to do is start out in something with low complexity. And, uh, but uh, we're, not we're not thinking about quantum computation here. So let's just say there is benefit in having a simple state. And from that perspective, you might think of the complexity as how hard is it to get your computer back to a simple state. Now, there's one very easy way to get to a simple state. Anybody know what it is? No matter how complex things are. Measure. Measure, measure all the qubits. Measure all the qubits. And um, they'll, you'll get up, down, up, up, down, up, down, up, down. And then you simply flip everyone that's down into up. That takes in, that takes at most in operations. Uh, so measuring all the qubits takes in operations. Flipping the ones that are in the wrong direction takes in more operations. That's not a lot. But when I say doing it reversibly, I mean doing it by unitary operation uh, to get back to where you were. Doing it reversibly with a unitary operation is a thing that's hard and which would take you an amount of time, uh, an amount of gates equal to the complexity of the state. Okay. All right, so here's what we expect. For an exponential amount of time, the complexity will increase, I would argue linearly. And then it will hover around up in here among the very, very large number of maximally complex states. This is very much like thermodynamics, where if you start way out of equilibrium with a very low entropy state, entropy will, it will increase linearly, and it, will, and it will increase linearly until you get to the maximal entropy for whatever your constraints are. If your constraints are energy, then it will get to the maximal entropy consistent with whatever your constraints are, and then it will just rattle around there. It's called equilibrium. It's called thermal equilibrium. It can fluctuate, and it can fluctuate right down to low entropy again, but that's an extremely rare process. And in terms of the complexity here, we could say we know the complexity on, times, on, on certain time scales has to be able to return to something small. There's a theorem. It's called the quantum recurrence theorem. It says that if you wait long enough, whatever state you started with, you will come back to the same state, or something very, very close to it. Okay. How long? Not e to the s, but e to the e to the s. That's the quantum recurrence time. So on a time scale of doubly exponential, you will from time to time discover that the, that the entropy, not the entropy, the complexity, has fluctuated back down and is down near zero again. Those are, the, those are quantum recurrences. They will happen. And if you ask, if you constrain yourself by saying, I have suddenly discovered that the complexity is small, 
How did it get there? What's the most likely way that it got there? It's simply the time reversal of the question of what is the most likely way the, the, the complexity will increase from that point. If the answer is linear, as I expect, then what you will expect is that the most likely way you got here is by simple process, which is just the time reflection of this one. Same things are true about entropy. If you had a box of gas, and you put all the molecules in the corner, and you ask, what do you expect to happen? You expect them to, uh, you expect things to evolve along some trajectory, which will take you to, uh, to a thermal equilibrium type state. If, on the other hand, you said, I also find, I also want to know what's the most likely way I could have gotten here by the natural evolution of the system without somebody intervening. How did it get that way? That's just running it backward, and the answer will simply be the time reversal of whatever the most likely way of having the entropy increase. So this is incredibly unlikely, but still, given that the entropy, no, I keep saying entropy, given that the complexity is small, very small, what's the most likely way you got there, and where are you most likely to go? Just time reflection of each other. Okay, so that's, uh, that's Is, is it known how much it rattles around? Well, you know, so we know that about the entropy. Yeah, we do know that about the entropy. Yeah, what did we decide? Uh, was it expert? Well, it's not. It doesn't. Thing. It doesn't follow from the definition like it does for the entropy. Mm -hmm. But it. Well, even for the entropy, it doesn't quite follow from the definition because it depends no. how many uh, macro states you have with a given entropy. Yeah. But uh, we thought that it was a water one gate just from counting arguments. But you could come up with I mean, you could come up with special systems where that wouldn't be true. But we don't expect it to be anything like the. Uh, we don't expect it to fluctuate on scales comparable to uh, to its own magnitude, mm. except on doubly exponential terms. So there's some fluctuation up there, and I think it's auto one, but uh, I don't know for sure. If the complexity grows, like e to the number of, sorry, if the number of states with a given complexity grows like e to the number to that complexity, then that counting argument tells you that up to the maximum, and then so Yeah, okay, so there, if you look at this curve, this curve does look very much like the growth of entropy. Ex let's say for a system of n, de n uh, classical degrees of freedom. A system of n classical degrees of freedom, this could be a discrete system. It could be a cellular automaton. You start in some simple state, then you allow it to evolve. It will have an entropy. The entropy uh, is some coarse-grained uh, uh, statistical entropy. The entropy will grow linearly for a while. This is an entropy, ordinary entropy. And then reaches the maximum. Its maximum uh, will, um, will be of order in itself. Okay. And then it will fluctuate. And then return to, uh, to on, on, on recurrence times. And those recurrence times will be e to the n, not e to the e to the n, for the classical system. Okay. This is behaving as if it were the entropy of a system not with n degrees of freedom, but with e to the n degrees of freedom. So the complexity is a vastly um, expanded uh, thing, which almost behaves as if it was the classical entropy of an exponentially large number of C bits. C bits meaning classical bits. We think there's a good reason for this. We think there is a good reason for this. Uh, but it's just something to note for the moment. That the time scale to come to equilibrium is exponential in N instead of N. And the time scale for recurrences is e to the e to the n instead of just e to the n. Okay, now here I imagine talking about unitary operator complexity. There's a connection between unitary operator complexity and state complexity, not the one I mentioned before, but in particular a, um, a connection for states which are composed out of two pieces maximally entangled. 
So let's imagine now that we have two components to our system. Get rid of this. Two components of our system, two in qubits. And they were created in the maximally entangled state. Okay. One of them's over here, one of them's over here. Let's not worry about the environment decohering these things. Okay. They were created, for example, by just taking bell pairs and splitting them between the two things here. We have n bell pairs or something like that. Uh, then we evolve it. The complexity will stay maximal. But, sorry, the entanglement entropy will stay maximal. So the idea of a maximally entangled pair of systems like this is time independent. Okay. But how do you describe, what's the most general state of a maximally entangled pair of systems like this? And the answer is, let's call the states on this side I, let's call the states on this side I bar. The most general state that I can write down is some matrix so matrix, I and I bar, I, I bar, summed over I and I bar. There's nothing more general than that, and we would say this is the, um, the, the wave function of the combined system. Okay. We would want to normalize it, but let's, uh, let's uh, assume we've done that. Okay, what is it, what is the nature of M's which correspond to maximum entanglement? So probably most of you know the answer to that. The answer is that M is unitary. Sorry, I, let me come back here. M, I, J. I, J bar is what I meant. Sum over I and J. And J bar. Well, the, the reason I put bar here is just to distinguish it from one. All right, what's the most general maximally entangled state? The most general maximally entangled state, oh, first, what would be the state just corresponding to bell pairs, the simplest bell pair state, where these were maximally entangled in the, you know, in the configuration 0, 0, plus 1, 1? That would just be that Mij is the, uh, is the unit matrix delta Ij. That's the maximally, that's the most, uh, um, uh, that's in some sense the simplest state that has the maximum entanglement. The most general state that has the maximum entanglement is to put a unitary matrix here. General unitary matrix, and that corresponds to maximum entanglement. You can prove that, that's not too hard to prove, I'll leave it to you to prove. And so the unitary matrix here, connecting I and J, let's just imagine a circuit that, that, that makes it. We start out at one end, and we put in a bunch of gates, or a bunch of Hamiltonians, or whatever, and the system evolves. It evolves from I to J, or from, uh, if we start in state I, we evolve, we get some superposition of states J here, that makes a unitary matrix. We can also think of that same unitary matrix as the wave function of a two-sided system, the two-sided system being labeled by I on this end and J on this end. And um, it's a representation of a wave function of a system. Don't think of it as an operator. OK, now, um, let's start with the simplest state. By simplest state, I mean that the simplest maximally entangled state, bell pairs, product of bell pairs. Each state here is entangled or is correlated with a state of exactly the same uh, configuration on the other side there. And now, what basis, what basis am I writing this in? Does it matter? Here's an exercise. Prove that this state has the same form in every basis. Whatever the basis of states that you're using, this state, sum over i, uh, i, 
is the same in every basis, so you don't have to answer the question, in which basis is this the state? It's the same in every basis. Okay. <coughs> questions up to now? Is this obvious or uh, the well, most important is that it's true? Okay. okay, so we started our system in the simplest possible maximally entangled state. You can think of it as a product of belt pairs. You can think of it as um, entanglement between energy states. You can think of it as an entanglement between anything you want because they're all the same. And we evolve it. Let's suppose it's energy states. We've written this maximally entangled state in terms of energy states. That means each one of these I's has its own energy. And let's evolve it with time, assuming that the two sides are independent of each other. Let's assume the two sides do not interact with each other. The two uncoupled systems are over here, or over here, they're far away from each other. Alice has one, Bob has the other, and they're just evolving separately and independently with the same dynamics. Then what we write here is e to the minus i h, let's call it Alice, plus h Bob, times t, and this is the way the system will evolve. What does this mean? This means it evolves the sum over i, i, i bar, e to the i minus i, energy of i plus the energy of i bar, but they're the same because these are the set. So that's just twice energy i times t. Is that clear? Um, this evolves to some new unitary matrix, to some new unitary matrix, and the new unitary matrix is just the time evolution matrix by amount 2t associated with the Hamiltonian in question. This is still of the form, sum over i and j, i, j, in any basis now, because this is general, some uij. And this uij is nothing but the time evolution operator, not by time t, but by time 2t. Why time 2t? Because both sides of the thing are, are, are evolving, and uh, both sides of the thing evolving just gives you this 2 here. All right, so the, the implication here is that if you start a system, let's draw a picture. If you start a system in the simple product of bell pair states, we'll represent that just by bell pairs. And now you let each side evolve, evolve by interactions, interactions. Make a sloppy mess out of it, we don't know what's going on here. And this side to evolve also. that the evolution, that the state of the, um, of the maximally entangled system, it stays maximally entangled, and the state of the system has a wave function which, which is nothing but the time evolution e to the minus iht, either for the left or the right, it doesn't matter, e to the minus iht, except twice the time because you've got two simultaneous evolutions going on here from zero to time t. The point being that the time evolution of the unitary operator here is the evolution of the maximally entangled state in this form, and the complexity, the growing complexity of the time evolution operator is the same as the growing complexity of the, uh, the two-sided system, the state complexity. It's the same as the state complexity of the two-sided system. Is that clear? Or, uh, okay. However, it's a restricted kind of state complexity. It's restricted to the rule that the gates which are allowed to act, act only on one side or the other side and we don't consider the possibility of gates interacting between two sides. 
So this is a notion of restricted complexity where you have a two-sided state complexity, where you have a two-sided system maximally entangled, you evolve it, but you evolve it according to the rule that all gates which act act either on the left or on the right, and there are no gates coupling them together. Gates coupling them together would involve uh, interactions between the left side and the right side. Under those circumstances, the state complexity of the maximally entangled system is the same as the complexity of the uh, unitary operator for the evolution of just one side. OK, enough generalities about complexity. Let's come to black holes now. It's a long story about the circuitous route from thinking about black holes to thinking about complexity. And I won't, I won't belabor you with it. Instead, we'll just jump right into it. Let's again start with a two-sided system. Oh, yeah, there is one point which I should spend a little bit of time on before we do that. There is an approximation that people are always making uh, who think about black holes or systems of qubits and so forth. And it's this approximation that the black hole is, or the degrees of freedom are at infinite temperature. And they make that approximation even if the black hole is a black hole of 10 to the minus 8 uh, Kelvin. Okay. What exactly does that mean, and why is that a fair thing to do? Let me explain it uh, in a... Yeah, let me explain it by example. Let's suppose we had a box with reflecting walls, a cavity, radiation in the cavity. The radiation is at temperature T. The temperature T could be a very high temperature, it could be a low temperature. But I say there is a sense in which at every temperature, no matter what the temperature is, you could think of it essentially as being infinite temperature. Here's the sense. Supposing we want to represent whatever's going on in this box by a set of qubits. A set of qubits, uh, for example, the qubits could be, we divide the box up into cells and we ask, is there a photon in that cell or isn't there a photon in that cell? If we make the boxes small enough, there won't be more than one photon in the cell. So we, we do that. That's, we can reduce it to some kind of qubit. Uh, situation. Um, there will be some entropy. There will be some entropy S. And there exists a minimal description of this in terms of qubits. How many qubits do you need to describe a state in that box? Well, to literally describe every feature of a state including all the ultraviolet structure and so forth, you need an infinite number because of all the large number of ultraviolet degrees of freedom. But on the other hand, at any given temperature, most of those degrees of freedom are not excited. They're frozen. It's just too cold to excite uh, the very high energy degrees of freedom. So let's throw them out. We throw them out by some procedure of renormalization group or tensor networks or whatever we like some procedure which allows us to thin degrees of freedom down, and, as, and if, we, if we want the most efficient description, the easiest description, we want to thin the description down to a number of qubits, which is in some sense minimal to describe the system. Okay. How many qubits, what's the minimal number of qubits that it takes to describe a system of entropy S? Well, you can't do it with less than S. You can do it with more than S, but most of the extra ones are irrelevant. All right, so for the system of radiation, here's what you might do. You might, you might divide the box up into cells, which each cell has a radius equal to the thermal radius. That's called L, or it's called little L, 
of order one over the temperature. Now, there are many, many, many ultraviolet degrees of freedom in each box, but we're not, we're not interested in them. How much entropy is in each box if we, if we make the size of each box equal to one over the temperature? What's the answer? One over a box? One bit. One bit. One bit. So in each box here, there is one bit. And basically that bit is telling us whether there is or isn't a photon of that wavelength in this box. We can be pretty sure there are no photons of much smaller wavelength because they're too energetic for that temperature. So whether there's a photon or not a photon in that box is the basic question we can ask. And um, how many boxes are there? Well, that's the entropy of the system. And this, okay, so we have, we've reduced it down to some kind of minimal description where the entropy is in fact equal to the number of qubits. Number of qubits, just a question of whether there is or isn't a long wavelength photon in each box. So then S is of order n. n being the number of qubits, the minimal number of qubits that it takes to describe the system. Well, if the entropy is equal to the number of degrees of freedom, what does that say about the temperature? It's infinite. It's infinite. <laughs> All right. That doesn't truly mean the system has infinite temperature. It just means the system, with respect to the degrees of freedom we've kept, is sort of maximally random. There's a lot of non-randomness there in the ultraviolet degrees of freedom. The fact that the ultraviolet degrees of freedom are not excited is what tells you the thing is cold. But if you throw away those degrees of freedom, then the number of the entropy is of order the number of degrees of freedom. That you can describe by saying the system is sort of maximally uh, random and that it has infinite temperature. So in a certain sense, every system uh, in thermal equilibrium is at infinite temperature if you say, I will describe the system by the minimum number of qubits or the minimum number of degrees of freedom that are relevant uh, to the system. I just say that because uh, we'll sort of use that as a sort of guiding idea. But anyway, here's our, here is our black hole, two-sided black hole. We've learned from one and other people that two-sided black holes could be thought of as two one-sided black holes, but entangled. There's a temperature associated with it. Normally, we think of a temperature as being a physical temperature. But if we throw away all the ultraviolet degrees of freedom out near the boundary here, then the same kind of logic makes sense to say that we can think of this as being an infinite temperature. Infinite temperature with a number of degrees of freedom n being of order s. How to make that infinitely precise, I don't really care. It, uh, it, uh, you, you hear over and over and over again that to describe a black hole of entropy s do it in terms of n qubits where n is equal to s. People don't usually apologize for it. Well, I apologize for it, but, uh, but um, it is a more or less standard idea. OK, so that's our picture. t equals infinity. And we have maximally entangled states. Maximally entangled states if we get rid of all the stuff which is not entangled because it's too hot, because it's too hot. Maximally entangled states, two of them. And at t equals 0, what is the state like? At t equals 0, it's very much like it's the so-called thermal field double state, summation over the left and the right uh, energy eigenvectors, i, i bar, with a factor which is e to the minus beta over 2 times ei, energy of the i state. This is the standard thermal field double. 
now I say for our purposes, if we're only interested in the degrees of freedom which are actually excited, we can say the temperature is zero is infinite. With infinite temperature, beta is equal to zero. This is gone. And it's just this maximally entangled state between the two sides. This, of course, is an approximation. But this is, this is a, a good starting point to, um, uh, to think about the connection with qubits and so forth. So maximally entangled state between the two sides. How does it evolve? It evolves with exactly these factors, e to the i twice ei times t. That's how it evolves. So it evolves away from t equals 0 in this direction here. And this is what things look like. Now what about each side of this? Each side of this is described by a density matrix. If you trace out over um, one side, what you see on the other side is ideal thermal equilibrium and it's stationary. Observer observing this side here will see something completely uh, consistent with thermal equilibrium with no time dependence. Same thing on this side. But the whole global state of the geometry is clearly not time independent. Something's going on. Something is growing here. And that growth has something to do with both sides. It's not a feature of one side or the other. It's a feature of the relationship between the two sides. Something's growing, and by the way, something is shrinking over here. For whatever reason, this question was never asked until fairly recently. What is it in the black hole which is shrinking on this side and growing on this side? I once asked Don Page, who knows more about the thermodynamics of black holes than anybody, and I've been, I've been curious about this for a long time, what is it that's shrinking on the side and growing on the side? The black holes are absolutely time independent. What's going on? Um, his first reaction is that it was the entropy. Why? What was he thinking? He was thinking that the black hole is kind of like a vessel of gas where all the gas starts at the center of t equals zero and evolves. This is a very low entropy state. It evolves with time. If you run it backward, it also evolves with time. Evolves with time. And what would you see? You would see an entropy, which would be exactly this kind of symmetric function of time that we spoke about a little, uh, a little while ago. A symmetric function of time will grow, will grow. But I remember saying to him, I mean, what do you mean the entropy? It can't be the entropy. The entropy is absolutely time independent, not the entropy. So he didn't know. I don't know that I ever asked anybody else about it. Um, let's ask another question. Whatever it is, let's try to define it more precisely. Let's try to define a quantity, a gauge invariant, what I mean by gauge invariant is a geometric quantity which uh, actually fills in what these surfaces are and what it is that's growing. So <coughs> what I'd like to do is slice up this geometry in a coordinate invariant way, in a way which is geometric, meaning to say not dependent on a particular choice of metric, and construct something which grows on the side and decreases on the side. So that's pretty easy to do. Anchor two points at a fixed time t over here and construct a space-like surface connecting them and choose it to be the space-like surface. Well, your first reaction might be the space-like surface of minimum volume. Well, that won't be right. Because of the Minkowski metric, space-like geodesics, for example, are the longest distance between two points. Of course, if you change the sign of a metric from, uh, the, uh, from the x squared minus dt squared to dt squared, the, the maximum will become minimum, so it's OK. But the answer is just for ordinary geodesics in Minkowski space, geodesics, space-like geodesics are maximum. For the same reason, for exactly the same reason, are uh, minimal surfaces 
What would a minimal surface? A minimal surface would probably be a light-like surface, which has no extension at all. Okay. It's the maximal surface, which is unique. There's a unique maximal surface connecting these two. And it looks something like this. At t equals 0, it's just that. t equals a little bit, it looks like that. These maximal surfaces are geometrically defined. They don't depend on coordinatization. And in particular, we can, they are infinite in length. They're infinite in length for the simple reason that the boundary geometry here diverges in the usual way that, uh, that um, ADS geometries uh, diverge. But let's pick something now. Let's pick the portion of this surface which is inside the horizon just to get something which is finite. Just to get something which is finite. We can do other things. We can try other things. We can try regulating this. But here's a natural regulator. Just take the amount that's inside the horizon. And that amount that's inside the horizon, amount I mean the volume, the spatial volume of that section. And we can track it. And guess what? It increases with time and increases classically indefinitely with time. Increases forever. So it's some geometric quantity, which is gauge invariant, which um, should be, if we were to translate this into language of ADS CFT, we would say it's some property of the state at each one of these times, which is growing. What is it? All right, so it grows indefinitely. Uh, maybe next time I'll, I'll teach you more about these surfaces. These surfaces are kind of interesting, but I'll tell you what happens as you go up later and later, there is an asymptotic state up here, which passes through t equals infinity on this side, t equals infinity on this side, which is the limit of maximal surfaces. It's homogeneous along it. It has translation symmetry uh, along it. It inherits the time translation symmetry of the outside regions here. And it's some particular surface. Here's how you can see that it's likely to be somewhere in the middle between the singularity and the horizon, a maximal surface. Here's the way you can see it. On the horizon here, if I were to just take the surface and go down to the horizon here, the light-like portions of it would, uh, uh, would be zero in extension. And that's all there is, is the light-like portion. So it would have zero extension or zero volume along the horizon. On the other hand, because the local spheres go to zero up here, it will also have zero volume up here. So somewhere in between, there's a, uh, a most favored surface of maximal volume. And in fact, there's a limit of it which goes up to t equals Infinity. Okay, so what do these maximal surfaces look like? Uh, one, one way to think about them, at late time, let's go to late time, at late time they tend to follow this maximal surface until they depart. Next one follows it a little further, a little later time. Next one follows it a little further, I should be only considering the part inside the horizon here. And so the way this thing grows is it grows from the edges. Just go a little further, there's a little more of it, a little more of it, and a little more of it. How does it grow? It grows linearly with time. The volume grows linearly, linearly with time. As this time goes up here, and you sit down and calculate it, you will find that the, let me try to draw it a little more clearly, there's a limiting surface that looks something like that. I've exaggerated it some. And at each anchoring time here, it will follow the surface closely and then depart. Depart inside the horizon. And then at the next time, there'll be a little more of it. It'll follow the same surface, and there'll be a little more of it. I can't draw it better. Just a little more of it. It'll just grow from the edges here and grow linearly with time. So that's one thing. K 
can this, can whatever this is, if it is a feature of the quantum state, if it is something that characterizes the quantum state at these times, and it should be, because it's after all, it's a gauge invariant uh, aspect of the geometry. If it's something which characterizes the quantum state, it cannot grow forever. Why not? Because by a quantum recurrence time, it has to come back to something very close to the thermal field level. So we know from the beginning, because black holes have finite entropy, that after a doubly exponential time, it must return to the same state. Okay. So whatever this thing which is growing, the classical physics can only tell you what it's doing for some, uh, on the scale of all possible times, a very small time. Doubly exponential, but, uh, but still. Okay. Does that mean it does grow for a doubly exponential time? I think it's a singly exponential time that it can grow for. We can come back to the arguments for that another time. But we do know that the classical description of the geometry, and in particular the classical description of this growth here, has to break down, uh, at least, if not, if not earlier, by a doubly exponential time. Another fact is that, there's, that we can project this into the past also. Let's see. Yeah, but we can consider it also into the past. No reason why we can't go backward. It's a similar surface down here. And so we see that this is quantity, which is the volume of these maximal surfaces, which starts out large, exponentially or doubly exponentially large, starts decreasing, comes to a minimum, and then goes back up. Okay. This Let me, uh, at what time it touches that external surface? It, it never quite touches it. Uh, so it, it just starts hanging, but when does it get like epsilon close? I'm just curious at what time scales this is. Oh, the time scale, no, the time scale. This is, is all S classical. Or? This is all classical, LADS. Okay, LADS. LADS. It's the LADS. only scale in the problem so far. Yes. On the other hand, the, the problem of when this breaks down that's got H bars in it. Uh, right. Yeah, so far everything, all the geometry is classical. So all scales. So in other words, when the time gets substantially bigger, five times LADS, the surface will be close to the uh, uh, it's very close. Don't ask me numerically how no. close I didn't figure that out. Okay, so we have exactly this kind of behavior that on the one hand, we do attribute to entropy of a system uh, and a, uh, and a cl classical entropy of a classical system at a recurrence. But this is not a classical system. Qu uh, quantum systems do not have things like this happening at singly exponential time. They have things like this happening at doubly exponential time. And so the natural thing to say uh, is that what this is measuring is the complexity of the state. When I say it's natural, it, was, it wasn't so natural at first. Uh, simply stated, I thought of everything it could possibly be. The only thing I could think of was it was uh, the quantum complexity of the state. Uh, Whatever this is back here, the interior geometry which grows uh, is hypothesis, some measure, if you like, some measure of how hard it would be to somebody who had control over the CFTs. Imagine somebody has control over the CFTs, they have a quantum computer and they can exert control over it. Whatever it is this here is growing, they suddenly decide, look, I would like to get back to the thermal field double. Why would I want to get back to the thermal field double? Well, it might be Alice and Bob, and Alice and Bob might want to jump in and meet. If they start out here, they're not going to meet. The only way they can meet, or they could meet if they could get down here, but um, their best bet is to try to bring the state back to something which, for example, 
looks like the thermal field double. Then they might have a chance of jumping in and meeting. What happens at earlier times here? That's a subtle question, and um, it's decreasing complexity. What, what do you know about decreasing entropy? Is decreasing entropy possible? Well, if increasing entropy is possible, and you run it backwards, it's decreasing entropy. Uh, would you reliably uh, like to uh, make predictions about systems whose entropy was decreasing? You would not, because they're extremely unstable. You move one little particle a little bit, and the whole thing blows up in your face and starts increasing the entropy. Same with complexity. So Alice and Bob would make a mistake if they went back to early times here and tried to jump in, because just the tiniest mistake would blow up in their face. But if they start here, they can try to jump in, and, well, they'll almost be able to, uh, to get together. So if they were presented with a black hole, an eternal black hole like this, at a fairly late time, when they couldn't jump in and meet, they might like to use their quantum abilities to apply gates or whatever it is that they would do to bring the state back from this configuration of high volume or high complexity. How hard would it be? How hard would it be? How long would it take them? How many gates would they have to apply to get back to where they have a chance at least of meeting and um, that sounds like it's a complexity issue. And I think it is a complexity issue. That was one of the reasons for thinking that, uh, that this extension here is complexity. It is a measure of how hard it is to get back. OK, but let's take it, let's take it, um, let's take it as a guess. Uh, by now, a, um, a if they use a measurement to reset the computer. Is that then going to give you a space No, it's time? just going to disentangle the two of them. If you have two entangled computers and you make a measurement on one or both of them, you just disentangle them, and that just makes it impossible completely. How about measuring them in a bell pairs? You know, pairwise and yeah. basis? Uh, yeah, that's probably pretty hard. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, that measurement in a bell pair basis. Oh, but to do that, they have to communicate. You interact, yeah, I was going to They have to communicate. That. Supposing they want to do it by operations on the two sides separately, well, they should be able to get to it, get to it because the system evolved separately on two sides. Mm -hmm. There was some evolution separate on the two sides, which brought it. There's no interaction between these systems either. Or they're entangled but not interacting. So just by the evolution of one of them, the sort of re idea of restricted um, evolution, restricted to be non-interacting, you should be able to get back to where you're going without communicating or without but the two sides that interacting. Isn't equally delicate to actually just going back in time and trying to go? What's that? Isn't that an equally delicate operation as, as if, they you had, bet. if they had just gone yeah, back? Yeah, yeah, time. yeah. Yeah, you make a mistake and you're caught. Right. right. Yeah, it is. But nevertheless, instead of, don't ask that, just ask how many gates it would actually take you to do it. And the number is the same as the number of gates that it took you to get to there. So that's the basic hypothesis. Let's go a little further. I'm going to tell you next time more about the geometry of these maximal surfaces, and I'll justify uh, maximal surfaces for black holes in various dimensions and so forth. I won't spend a lot of time on it. It's a little bit tedious, but it's straightforward. Uh, supposing I have a quantum system at a temperature T, an entropy S. It could be a quantum computer, and when I, when I say a, uh, an, a temperature, I could mean the energy per, uh, per qubit is a good measure of temperature, typically. And this thing is just meaninglessly going along uh, computing. Somebody wrote some stupid program and just iterated and iterated. It has no purpose, whatever. It's just um, uselessly 
computing. It starts, it could be two entangled computers, starting in the belt pair state and just evolving and evolving. How fast does it generate entanglement? Or how fast generally, it could be a bath of hot water. That, uh, that, uh, how fast does a uh, bath of hot water generate uh, isolated bath? How fast does it generate complexity? So, let me make a guess. I will make a guess. This guess turns out to be a very good guess. Um, but let's make the dumbest guess we can make. The bigger the system, in other words, the larger the number of qubits, if it's evolving under its own uh, Hamiltonian, the number of effective gates that happens per unit time is proportional to the number of qubits. For example, in each, in each time interval, you might have every qubit interacting with one other qubit, something like that. Whatever you like. Invent some, invent some dynamics, which doesn't involve more than two qubits interacting with each other at a time. But everybody gets to interact in each, uh, in each uh, time interval. Um, it's pretty clear the number of the number of gates in one time interval will be proportional to the number of qubits, and therefore the rate of increase will be proportional to the number of qubits. That suggests that we write down our formula for the time derivative of complexity that we write down a factor here, which just measures the size of the system. What better than the entropy to describe the number of degrees of freedom? Number of degrees of freedom of a evolving black hole is roughly s. OK, that's the left-hand side here is dimensional. It has an inverse time. Complexity is dimensionless, and entropy is dimensionless. That means we need a rate, a quantity with a, with a, with a, a rate in here. Uh, what, uh, what quantity with a rate is very general and uh, likely to tell you how fast things are interacting? It's only one, the temperature. That's, or in other words, a guess. This is a guess that the complexity after time t is s times t times time. As a physicist, I appreciate the need to give more fancy mathematical arguments for this. When I was a plumber, these were the kind of arguments that we used, and boy, did they work well. This one did work. But let me tell you, when I was a plumber, when they failed, it was spectacular. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> there's very little harm in making the wrong argument as a physicist. <laughs> See if we can if we can make a nicer geometric statement than this. What I'm going to do is consider a particular kind of black hole. A black hole. It turns out this is the formula is more general. But let's take an ABS black hole whose Schwarzschild radius. I don't want to introduce any extra extraneous um, parameters in the problem. Whose Schwarzschild radius is about ABS. The formulas I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you next time, are much more general. But let's take, I call this a unit black hole. It's basically the smallest stable black hole that you can have at ABS. If you like, here's your ABS. And it's a black hole whose size is roughly the radius of curvature of ABS. Um, Turns out you don't lose very much generality by just looking at that. All right, in that case, the temperature, what is the temperature of such a black hole? It's 1 over LABS. So 
So this is 1 over LABS. What about the what about the entropy geometrically? Well, we know that's the area of the horizon over here divided by G. Now, there are there's a local two sphere over here, or local sphere, whatever the dimensionality is. It goes to zero up here. It goes to some finite fraction, let's say a half, I think, uh, for the BTZ black holes, it goes to um, 1 over the square root of 2 of the area over here. The area over here is about the same order of magnitude as the area over here. So this area could be taken to be the area on the maximal surface here. It wouldn't matter very much. And it, just in terms of um, orders of magnitude, it's about the same to within a factor of 2. In fact, for every black hole that I know, the area on this maximal surface here is to within a factor of two of the area at the horizon. Okay? So this is qualitatively true. And what happens if you take the area and you multiply it by the time? The time here means the coordinate, let's say we, let's say we stop it over here, go over to here. This time over here is essentially the same as the total time parameter from here to here within a factor of two. Remember, time in here flows this way. The time along here, between here and here, is, or the time, these time variables here, is the same as the time or the time coordinate between here and here. So if I take the time coordinate, between here and here, and I multiply it by the area, what I get is the volume of this space-like surface, the volume of the maximal surface. Time is just a space-like measure along here. Area is the area of the local two sphere. This basically becomes the volume of the, let's give it its name, the Einstein-Rosen bridge at time t. I bet to find the Einstein-Rosen bridge with this maximal surface. So that's a volume divided by G divided by LADS. This formula, which came ultimately from ST uh, times T, seems to be very general. They identify the complexity then with this particular combination, and it's the volume which grows. It's the volume which grows. G and LADS are just fixed numbers. And this was the, uh, the first proposal for how complexity was related to the geometry in the interior of the black hole. It's, a, it's basically a one-step thing to go from volume to action, but we'll do that next time. Uh, so what is, the, what is the question there? In a sense, there are probably many things which grow linearly with time in a black hole, many different quantities, complexity being one of them, and volume of a minimal surface being another one, identifying them is um, something which is clearly very conjectural. The question is what kind of tests are there of it? What kind of additional tests uh, can be carried out where we think we have good reason to know both how the geometry behaves with time and how circuit complexity behaves with time and try to compare them? Right? There are a set of tests. The tests uh, spectacularly agree with, uh, with each other, or the two quantities, the growth of the rate of complexity and the rate of um, growth of volume. And I'll tell you about them next time. What kind of things are they? They're things in which you perturb the geometry in various ways away from the uh, thermal field double. You send in shock waves, you send in whatever you like, and the effect is an effect on the geometry 
But you can also ask how it would affect the same kind of perturbations on a quantum circuit. How would, the, uh, how would it affect the complexity, the growth of complexity of a quantum circuit? So you're trying to do calculations on both sides. Quantum circuit being perturbed in various ways. Geometry being perturbed in various ways by perturbations. And compare them. And um, although we wouldn't be talking about this if they didn't compare well. Well, in detail, in some detail, in some very precise detail. So we'll do that next time. And um, then those who don't accept the idea that complexity and volume or complexity and action make sense may leave the room and go away, and we'll just continue to assume that this makes sense. <laughs> I think probably most of you have seen these ideas before, probably have seen them in some detail. Uh, I'm curious, how, how persuasive do you find, uh, uh, find the arguments? Clearly not as persuasive as the ideas connecting um, entanglement with geometry. And I think with good reason, they shouldn't be as persuasive. Um, but I'm just curious if you would the compare the two. How, how persuasive do you find uh, the, uh, the arguments that have been given up to now connecting complexity with, uh, with geometry? Uh, I'm not that. Uh, loyalty, loyalty, come on. Uh, <laughs> come on. Trump's guys are around him this swarming all over him. Okay, I think that I think it's a lot more persuasive after the checks than before. No, oh, yeah, of course, of I course. Mean, now we have. Of course. No, this this argument at this stage was what else could it be? I can't think of anything. Right. Both go linearly, and I don't uh, and I don't know anything else that can grow for long periods of time. So let's try it out. The checks which are based on perturbing the geometry and perturbing quantum circuits and comparing them are detailed, or rather detailed, uh, and um, we'll check those out. And there's a sense an infinite number of checks, but of course they're all of the same kind. Uh, you send them various shock waves, one shock wave, two shock waves, ten shock waves, a thousand shock waves, and they will all agree. Um, the yeah, I think the next time we'll probably talk about Stanford Schenker shock waves and how the Stanford Schenker shock wave idea uh, couples together with these ideas of complexity. There is a Decreasing complexity is uh, uh, decreasing complexity is likely to be unstable, right? Just like decreasing entropy. Let's go back into the past. Take a system of decreasing entropy and flick it. What happens? It takes a little while. Um, what happens if yeah? You know, what happens if you flick it over here? Is it will reverse its time dependence locally near the place where you flipped it. But it won't uh, stop, uh, it won't stop the time or the evolution of the uh, things reversed in some distant portion of the system. It'll take time before the flicking uh, spreads out and tells the system, oh, you're going in the wrong direction, turn around. Okay. Uh, Flicking this means making a very small perturbation on the boundary, but at a time long in the past. So the tool that we have for examining what's going on in terms of complexity is, first of all, some intuition for how complexity of a circuit, a circuit which happens to be going in the direction of decreasing complexity, and you flick it, how does it respond? How long does it take before the circuit turns around? What's the detailed evolution of the complexity with time? And compare that with what happens if you perturb this diagram by a small perturbation from the boundary over here. What happens? And we'll see this detailed agreement. And in particular, 
the detailed agreement will involve a instability uh, associated with perturbing the system long in the past. And while this instability and will explicitly, for example, be able to see that if you flick the system in the long past, you turn around the direction of complexity. By that I mean you turn around the growth of the volume. A little flick at the bottom of the diagram over there will, in a very short amount of time, cause the volume which is decreasing to suddenly start increasing. So we'll see that there's that kind of correspondence. Um, and we'll, I will try that question again next week. I expect you to prepare yourself to give the right answer. Otherwise, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I hear the, uh, the king of China is going to be the king for life, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Emperor, not king. Emperor? Emperor. You're right. Emperor. Yeah, well, the king of America may also be the uh, king of life. Lenny, yeah. so you said you don't know any other quantity that grows linearly for the right amount of time. Are there these, what are these frame potentials? Oh, I don't know. Because they seem like they have the same sort of behavior. They may be the right definition, something related to the right definition of complexity. Yeah. But they could be different. Uh, I guess that's still, like, if I was to say the one thing which is com not confusing to me is complexity in a way that's simply related to gate complexity. Because there's other things that grow until exponential times when you're leaving. There are. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I can think of uh, things that we've been uh, fooling around with in particular. Uh, but those things are hard to define for time-dependent Hamiltonians. Oh. And we are explicitly going to be studying this for, uh, for shockwaves and things which I don't think I would know how to... Um... My guess is if you found a thing which behaved like complexity, behaved like the load, it would be closely related to it. I mean, you would hope to find something that you can compute, right? Well, like the, the entanglement versus complexity, like a lot, we know a lot more about entanglement. We can because we can compute it. Like I've been thinking about this systems. for a long time. My first, I got interested in complexity a fairly long time ago. Not that into black holes. I just got interested in it, so, and then I learned from Feynman about I'm not from him personally, but I learned from Feynman that quantum things can be incredibly complex. I knew that this complexity idea was a very, very subtle feature of quantum states that was just really hidden structure that, uh, that was far from anything that was directly measurable about, the black, about systems in general, but that it was some subtle world of correlations that were way beyond uh, the mm -hmm. I also knew that the interior of horizons were very subtle, beyond the ability to examine from the outside. And it was a long time ago that I got, could this have something to do with complexity? Yeah, that's crazy. It was really as a consequence of thinking about the AMPS paradox that uh, really focused attention on this. Um, but the idea that there was a hidden world of phenomena that take place in the growth of complexity, and, and uh, um, that I felt that something like that was going on in black hole horizons. Now, um, but it was very much trying to disentangle what was going on, and in particular, one at some point after we had been thinking about these Einstein Rosen bridges said, you know what keeps, you know what keeps uh, the space uh, uh, behind the horizon clear from firewalls? It's the fact that the space keeps growing. And the fact that it keeps growing opens up new space all the time. And when he said that, I started to think again, what is it that's growing? What is it that's growing? Uh, it can't be entropy. That saturates very fast. 
It's got to be something more subtle than it to be. It's got to do with the human Feynman's huge number of quantum states uh, that go way, way beyond the maximal entropy of the system. And that was that was the uh, that was the puzzle that was there. What is it that grows long after a system is in thermal equilibrium? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, we, what are we doing next week? <laughs>